Welcome to the Super Sentai Buddies. This is episode two of The Spider-Man Who Loved Me, the internet's best and only podcast about the tokusatsu television series Spider-Man. Every week where we need an episode of something, anything, we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listeners. My name is producer Mark and with me as always is my co-host and buddy Brian. Brian, how you doing this week? Fine man. Uh, Also... It's entirely possible that this is not the best and only podcast on this particular show. Yeah, that's very true. That is a, that is a good point. We should look at that and consider slightly altering our opening segment, which we, I mean, obvious to all listeners of this program, is just a rehash of Matt J's opener for every Super Sentai Brothers series. Right. I but think you're probably we... right. This is a Marvel property. Someone's probably talking about it somewhere. Right. I think if we just throw the word probably in there, it smooths over everything and gives us plausible deniability. Okay. I like it. So, prior to recording tonight on this very regular run-of-the-mill night that could really be any night, any night of the week, really at any night of the year, it could be. Yes. There's there's nothing specific about this day at all. No. No. There's this day not. when this podcast is definitely dropping exactly on the time we intended it to, you know, shortly right. after we recorded it. Yes. Uh, you you probably could be more or less vague. <laughs> so, so we are recording The Spider-Man Who Loved Me because we recorded episode one of it and really just fell in love with the show. So we decided we'd record at least a couple more of them and put them in the can, so to speak, so that we have another episode of something recorded in the event that we need an emergency substitution again. So we're just going to pretend like this is being recorded, you know, live the week it airs like most of our shows, but uh, it is being just recorded at, at some indeterminate time in your past, listener. So, noting that we are going to be recording a few of these episodes, but not really able to make them sort of time timely? Make them... On time. Yeah, on time. We talked about how we were going to handle the five stars. And uh, rather than jettisoning the segment entirely, we decided to sort of turn it into a quick conversation piece to open the show so for the next couple of episodes we're going to use the five stars to discuss basically top five lists for each of us around categories wherein we share an interest for instance this week the five stars are going to be a discussion of comic book movies right our personal favorites and when we say personal favorites we mean at the day and time that we happen to think (laughs) and pick them uh, maybe we forgot one, maybe, uh, maybe just maybe we haven't watched that one that you've watched that, you know, is the greatest yeah. comic book movie ever. Yeah. You are right. If you asked me again tomorrow, you may get a very different list. Right. But what a, what an embarrassment of riches to even be discussing as dudes right. who both grew up as comic book nerds in the eighties and nineties. It would be hard for the child versions of us to fathom just the glorious cinematic wonderland that the grown-up versions of us are living in. Indeed. And I will also note that these are on the lists because we like them, not necessarily because they are the greatest gift to movie them. (laughs) Very good point. These are not the five best comic book movies by any subjective or objective measure no these are our five favorites right now here in the moon future all right let's kick it off okay so what is star number one for you brian uh well these are in no particular order uh but i will throw out uh the original superman movie and when i say original i mean the first one in the 70s it's it's the one that kind of kicks off the idea that you even could actually bring a superhero movie to life. Um, It has Gene Hackman, who is one of my all-time favorite actors as Lex Luthor. Um, 
Man, it has is a be- good call. I'm kind of embarrassed yeah. that I didn't think of it. Uh, well, I, I think because it's, you know, it's older, it gets a little bit left behind. It's also yeah. got that great John Williams score. Oh. Um, it's got Superman before we decided that Superman needed to be as dark as Batman. Um, <laughs> it's just It's just got a lot of nice... Like 1970s style filmmaking and set pieces, and it's it's just an enjoyable picture the whole way through. Also, it is probably the first superhero movie that I ever saw. Yeah, it just it captures that sort of aw shucks wonder of comic books in the hmm, in the era before we all got jaded. And I don't say that as a judgment thing, because there's some right. great comics in that in that post '90s era as well. But right. early comics just had that kind of that spirit of of belief or something to them. Right. And that first Superman movie really hits it. And, and yep. I read not too long ago, maybe a month ago, I read a book called Superman versus Hollywood. Uh huh. Uh, and the subtitle of it was something like how fiendish producers and warring writers grounded an American icon. Hmm. It's a tremendous book. It walks through Superman like from the television era onward. And it's really I mean, it is well worth reading. Interesting. So my star number one, uh, yep. also like you, no particular order. Uh, I went with Hellboy 2, the Golden Army. For two reasons. Number one. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, I'm thinking back to the guy from Harlem. (laughs) Number one, it's kind of personal. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Number one, the visual aesthetic of that movie is just incredible, especially for a movie that was operating on a sub $50 million budget. Right. It's gorgeous, and it captures the weirdness of Hellboy in, in just a great way. And number two, because of the performances of Ron Perlman and Doug Jones, that that movie is just a an acting class from Ron Perlman. He is in his element. You can see him strutting all over the screen. It's just, I love that film so much. It makes me sad that we are not going to get that third Hellboy movie. Uh, that... There's a Hellboy uh. reboot coming, apparently. See, but that's not that's not what anyone actually wants. No. No. What people do want though is star number 2. Star number 2. Uh my star number 2, I will throw in a movie that I enjoy even though it's not the greatest. I I really enjoy the Keanu Reeves uh Shia LaBeouf Constantine. Oh. <laughs> I I I will say that I like that movie. I don't I, know that it would crack like my top 50%, but it's it's watchable and fun. It, here's the thing. If I want to have like one of these movies on in the background, that is a great one to have. Just like, yeah, John Constantine shooting demons and stuff in the background <laughs> of your day. Like it's 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 in some ways low key, but it's 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 just enjoyable. I uh Huh, I just real I just realized that some of these films on my list have uh they share similar actors, actresses. Uh Tilda Swinton is in that movie. Uh and it's it's pretty great. Like every everything about that movie is fun. It's not great, uh but I enjoy it an awful lot. Uh what's what's your number 2? I'll I'll go with the obvious one, which is Guardians of the Galaxy, a film which I imagine is is only not on your list because I took it on mine. Yes, that is that is absolutely true. That's another thing to note about these lists. We try to compare so we don't have overlap. Yeah. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy, I I would say it is is a near perfect movie. It is. It it. In both a cinematic sense and in a comic book nerd sense. Uh, It is not perfect insofar as it perfectly represents the comics. We all know that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a universe next door to the comics. But it is just, it is, it is 
a comic book come to life, and that's pretty incredible. We don't need to cover, you know, we're not breaking new ground here. Plenty of ink has already been spilled on how amazing that is, but we had to get it out there. Oh, yeah. Guardians is, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, it's, it's a film that I like to say there is not a wasted shot in the entire movie. Yeah, from that's a very be- good point. From beginning to end, everything is there that needs to be there, and it's great. Okay, moving on, star number three. Star number three, I'm actually going to throw out another movie that Tilda Swinton is in, mm. and also a movie that uh, Chris Evans is in. Uh-huh. And that is Snowpiercer. I will embarrass myself by saying I have not seen Snowpiercer. Okay, I will embarrass myself by pointing out that I've only seen Snowpiercer once. The rest <laughs> of the films on this list I have seen multiple times. But I saw Snowpiercer once, which is based, I believe, off of a French graphic novel, uh, which is how it ends up on the list. Didn't um, actually know that. I looked that up because I was looking up a list of all comic book movies. I'm like, uh-huh. Snowpiercer, really? I really, really enjoy it. Part of it is I was just flipping through Netflix one day and it happened to be on. And I'm like, yeah, I'll watch uh, Captain America on a train with Tilda Swinton <laughs> doing a sci-fi thing in in freezing cold. Like, it, sure. yeah, it's it. It was a great experience. Um it is cool, it's, too, because we are both old enough to remember the era where you could just stumble upon a movie by way of surfing the television. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you can still do that now. Right. But yeah. it is fun to recreate that every now and then by stumbling across something on Netflix. Right. Hey, man, uh, the other night, I was it was very late at night, and I managed to watch all of The Rock, which was great. Nice. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Snowpiercer... I, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it's a visual feast where Captain America leads a resistance on a train going across a frozen earth. Um, and it's it's basically like a car by car, you know, film right. where all of the cars, very different visuals, different feel. It's it's a movie that you really have to watch. Um, okay, but it's, I will. It's uh, it's great to look at. Um, characterizations are great. I really like it. What is your number three? Number three for me is Dread, the 2012 reimagining of the Judge Dread comic. And I will embarrassingly say I did not see that or the Sylvester Stallone Dread. Wow. Now I have, yeah. Admittedly, I am a big fan of. The Judge Dread Strip. From well, he is the law, right? He is. He is the law, and I will openly admit that the movie fails a bit in capturing the kind of uh, hyper satirical tone that the comic has. Does I mean does the new film fail as hard in that as the nineteen eighties one does? No, <laughs> probably not. No, uh, but it is just. It's another one that is on there largely because it is a visual feast. Mm -hmm. And while I enjoy a good cerebral movie, I am also a sucker for just a good visual work of art. Plus, Carl Urban is incredible always, and he kills it as Dread. Nice. Okay, because we are short on time. Star number four. Uh, short on time, star number four. Speaking of people who are always incredible in everything they're in, Spider-Man 2 with Alfred Molina as Dr. Octopus. Alfred Molina is just the boss. Ah, I love him in everything he's in. He is, he is one of my favorite working actors today. And the fact that he got to portray probably my favorite Spider-Man villain uh, it's it's so great, and it's a Spider-Man No More tale. Uh, it is it is not Spider-Man Three or <laughs> the Spider-Mans that followed that. Um, I have hope for the new kid, but uh, Spider-Man yeah. Two was really out of the Spider-Man films we got, probably hands down the best one. 
for a future five stars, we should really do character actors that we love. We should. We will not talk about that now because we're already <laughs> short on time. But yeah, Spider-Man 2, I, it's it's really got everything you could love if Doc Ock is your favorite villain. And you need precious, precious <laughs> trinium. So my number four will go back to the Tilda Swinton well one more time with mm-hmm. Doctor Strange. That's another visual feast. It is. It is. And another one, much like Dread, and probably Hellboy, to be fair, that is tipped mm-hmm. by the fact that I really love the source material. Mm-hmm. Marvel has really figured out a formula with their with their comic book movies. There's no doubt right. about that. They know what they're right. doing, and they're doing right. it well. Right. Doctor Strange is a very specific vibe, though. Mm-hmm. The art direction, everything, the story is very odd. You know, Doctor Strange is a is a uh, a modern day wizard, or you know, however you want, sorcerer, right? The supreme one, in fact. Right. And man, I love Doctor Strange to begin with. Not as much as Matt J, but I love Doctor no. Strange. And this movie just got it in a way that I wasn't sure could be done. So. That's a big part of why it's on the list for me, as Tilda Swinton makes at least her third appearance on our list. Yeah, I'm I'm not quite sure how that happened, but apparently Tilda Swinton <laughs> is in three of these movies. Um, Shall we? Flipping, go ahead. Yeah, flipping over to the last one I have, uh, Captain America Winter Soldier, as Star Chris Evans five. makes his second appearance on the list. Captain America Winter Soldier is really everything I could want from a modern day (laughs) Captain America movie for a number of reasons, not the least of which was all of the marketing focused on the Winter Soldier angle. And if you're a fan of comic books, you were aware of the Bucky Winter Soldier thing and you just presumed going into that film that it's going to be Captain America tracks down Bucky. And that's part of it. What You and I did not assume, uh, because we saw it together and both realized it as it was basically too late for our heroes to realize it, (laughs) was it was secretly a Hydra overthrow shield movie, which was the greatest. it, It was something that I never thought I would see just because I figured it would be too difficult to stage that. I'm not sure I have ever had a moment in an American cinema that I have enjoyed more than being thoroughly surprised by a bunch of hail hydras. I, it was, it, it, it really is all I could ever ask for in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and not for nothing, like, I think Captain America, even when someday the grand run of comic book movies ends and we go into another dark period, I think Winter Soldier will still stand out as just hands down a good political thriller movie. Yeah. Um, divorced of any of its super heroics. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's hands down just a good movie on top of being a good comic book movie. It was better than White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen. <laughs> I saw uh, neither of those, and I still don't remember which one's which. <laughs> and my fifth star, just to end us out on a high note, is the recent Lego Batman movie. It just it tickled my fancy. It it is goofy. It is comic. It is absurd. It is also a nice DC flick to get up there. Yep. Uh, I just I had such a good time at the theater watching this movie. Yeah, I it, it even had heart, which is definitely something that has been missing from the Batman universe. Yeah, it really did. It was it it took you on, admittedly a little bit thin, but it took you on an actual emotional journey. Right. Which is a <laughs> while that may be thin, it's more of an emotional journey than Batman has been on in about a quarter century. All right, man, time to take a break and watch episode two of Spider-Man, A Strange World, A Man Who Follows His Destiny. And we will be right back. Change the apart And we're back. That uh, 
Boy, that episode sure had a different pacing than episode one. It uh, it certainly did, uh, partially due to flashbacks. But <laughs> I, I I think I have a little better handle on a couple of things, and I want to lead with those so we don't so we don't take up too much time going over them during the discussion. Uh, one, yeah, man, go for it. The spider machine is the GP seven. It's just the car. It's the spider car. Two, Marveller is the Garia spacecraft. Yeah. Uh, and it is specifically the spacecraft mode because Marveller turns in to Leopardon, which is the robot mode. Change so, Leopardon. Right. So Marveller, Leopardon, they're the same thing. It's just different modes. And the GP7 docks in Marveller. Right. I believe he has to dock it to actually pilot Leopardon. Oh, so he pilots Leopardon from inside the car from inside the leopard robot. Yeah, more or less. Love I think it. he Yeah, yeah, that's so that that actually clears up a whole bunch of what was going on last time when I was trying to figure <laughs> out what are these things and the answer is no, there's just one spaceship that has a car inside of it. My first note, theme song still rules. Yes, we just open on the theme song. I'm a uh, I'm pretty good with that, uh, with giving up peace and giving up everything. <laughs> theme song so intense. It is. <laughs> okay, so the actual opening, once we get past the strange 70s Spider-Man James Bond theme song, is Garia the Spider hanging out on the curtains in Spider-Man's room. Takoya's room. Yep. Uh, and basically tells him, hey, wake up. It's time to go be Spider-Man. Yeah. 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 Garia is apparently just hanging around the household these days. Yep. Yep. Telling and, him when he's supposed to be Spider-Man. Yeah, I guess, you know, Spider-Man has not got used to patrolling the streets yet. So Garia is is there to do it for him. So the kid jumps up, yep, kind of peeks out his window, and we get the title card. As aforementioned, the episode is called A Strange World, A Man Who Follows His Destiny. Very literal titles so far. Yep, and he uh, wakes up and goes out on the town to follow his destiny as Spider-Man. He does. He follows that destiny all up the side of a building. Right. Uh, I get the feeling that he's out there to fight the wind, maybe. Yeah, we're sort of given to understand that. We get treated to a little wall crawling with some more of that rad late 70s music. Yep. Get used to Spider-Man climbing up the side of this building and sitting in the (laughs) corner. I think that's going to happen a lot. Probably. You know that scene in The Tick where he just kind of perches on top the building and watches the city below? It's kind of like that. This is Spider-Man's watch building. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you want from him. It's the tallest building in the city, probably. I got no problem with that. He's on patrol. So, I mean, he's you know, on stakeout, <laughs> I guess. Right. Stake out of the whole city because his spider sense works way better than regular Spider-Man. <laughs> and yeah, there is just some real violent winds going on. And we get treated to, a, was it a newscast or was it the announcer? I think it might have just been the announcer. Yeah, I think it was the announcer. Stating that there are violent winds in the Tokyo region, but they later died down as if nothing had happened. Right. Our hero sees nothing happen. Is it? For all we know. Isn't that how all weather works? Like it happens and then it stops happening? Hey, the announcer said it, so it must be evil weather. (laughs) The wind started up and then that's just, this is the way the world is now. Wind forever. (laughs) And, uh, yeah. Have we talked about that announcer yet, by the way? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure we have. There is an intermittent announcer in this series who comes on a la... Ted Knight? Sure. That's not his... <laughs> a la the old radio serials to just kind of propel the plot along from time to time. 
that device works very well for me. I don't know about you, but I, I actually really love the announcer. Hey, man, I picked Ted Knight. Was he the one who did Meanwhile in the Hall of Justice? Yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, so it is that classic kind of comic booky style. The next thing we get is daytime back in Spider-Man's house where yep. his sister is trying to wake up his little brother. If you if you don't recall from last week, Spider-Man, his sister and his young brother all live in the same house that was owned by their dad until last week when he was killed by Professor Monster. Yep. So while she is trying to kind of rouse Takuji, Shinko sees a spider. She reacts like I react around spiders. (laughs) Which is to say, not well. As though an emissary of hell has shown up on your doorstep to personally make away with your soul. You say that as if you mean it figuratively, (laughs) but I know, in fact, it is literal. So Takuji looks around, does not see a spider, and somehow that turns into his sister accusing him of hiding spiders in the house? I... That's a horrible thing to do to anyone. <laughs> uh, Let's be honest, though. I mean, that is a thing a seven-year-old boy probably would do. That's not an unreasonable accusation. No, not if he wants to make it till eight, though. <laughs> but anyway, all of that is broken up because Hitomi, uh, Spider-Man's girl, uh, yeah. she shows up and basically needs a ride. And also wants to wake our hero, who is also, like me, sleeping until 10, 10, 30, <laughs> yeah. 11. Because, like you, he was out fighting the denizens of evil all night. Right. Or staying up way too late. But still, still, he needs his spider sleep. Right. So Hitomi shows up and says there's been an accident. A train has overturned. And because she makes her bread by selling photos to newspapers, she needs to get over there to get a picture. Right. This Uh, is, you will recall, the late 1970s, so people are not already snapping pictures of this thing and posting them to the Twitter. Right. Also, this is the first time I really put together that, wow, this is going to be awkward to get, like, good shots, because Peter Parker... American Spider-Man's entire deal in photojournalism is the fact that he is also Spider-Man and can set up those shots. Yeah. So the fact that she does not have spider powers uh, is going to make it very, very hard to bilk people in the news reporting industry of great shots, shots of (laughs) Spider-Man. Yeah, but she doesn't know she's going for shots of Spider-Man yet. She just needs shots of that train. Yep. And she has a boyfriend who has a fast motorized bicycle. Right. Uh, Who at one point after waking him up uh, asks if that thing can go faster. And then uh, in in what is not a loving way asks, you know, I don't know if this is about your dead dad or what, but (laughs) you seem kind of mopey here. I don't know Um, if you are mad or sad because your father was killed. Right, but you are not driving fast enough for me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, whoa, whoa. That's that's a little too personal for this stupid turned over train. Yeah. <laughs> could you could you not poke the sore spot of my father who was murdered in front of me? Thank she you. She immediately follows it up by asking, "Don't you have any regrets?" <laughs> well, I I'm not real sure what that line is going for. Um, Yeah, what does she want him to cop to here? Like, you're right, I I should have spent more time with my dad instead of riding on my motorcycle with my hot girlfriend. Right, I think she's wanting him to cop to he's driving too slow and he should drive (laughs) with reckless abandon. Which he then does. into the raw emotions connected to your dead dad so that you will want to drive faster. That is a different show altogether. (laughs) Probably an iteration of Japanese ghost rider Mm, i want that show now yep (laughs) 
I really need 1970s Japan to have done about a dozen of these things. Here's the thing. How would they up Ghost Rider? Because Ghost Rider already is an emissary from hell. True. I guess they could partner him up with a spider. (laughs) Anyway. So they get pretty close to the train. They get stopped by a police roadblock. And Chatter Around is explaining that the violent wind last night made the train overturn. Sure. Violent wind does that to trains all the time. Not according to the announcer. There's never been an accident like this before. Oh, well, I stand corrected. (laughs) So, yeah, those winds, pretty violent, I guess. Are you ready for the next cut? Dear listener, I don't think you are. (laughs) I certainly wasn't, and I certainly wasn't when it turned into a theme. I'm still not sure how to grapple with this scene, but here we go. Takoya goes to church. A Catholic church. Yep. Takoya goes to a Catholic church, specifically the one where his father is buried. Does he go to the cemetery? Briefly. But he spends a lot more time staring fixedly at the crucifix. Yep. Uh, Jesus induces a flashback. Yes. He's like, he's standing in church, kind of looking up at Jesus. It's that classic. It's, it's, I mean, it's the crucifix. It's the, the Jesus with a thin, gaunt face kind of turned down and sideways in despair. And he's doing a little bit of soul searching about Garia and Planet Spider. And and as you say, flashes back to get some more kind of pre-show plot fleshed out. But that flashback continues to be intermixed with shots of Jesus. Yes. It's very weird. Yes, which is which is especially strange because he will comment on how Garia saved him. And he's basically saying, Jesus, this other guy saved me. Yeah, I was trying to decide if Garia was supposed to be like a type of Christ. I I put him as Space Spider Jesus. Space Spider Jesus, done and done. So what we get here is a deeper, more fleshed out version of the plot that was explained to us last week. It is roughly this. 400 years ago in the M77 Nebula, there was the 17th Milky Way. In the 17th Milky Way. There was Planet Spider. Professor Monster attacked it with the Iron Cross army. Garia was, yeah, Garia was out uh, at the massively impractical hat store. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Garia just happened to be away. And he got back wearing just the weirdest helmet. Yep. I Did Garia have, like, the entire defensive power of this planet with him? Was it just Leopardon? Is that it? Yeah, maybe Leopardon is the only defender. I don't know. Oh. Anyway, he comes back basically wearing Marvel Comics villain Strife. Basically <laughs> wearing his hat from the Rob Layfield era. It's it's a hat, listener. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, he comes back, everyone is dead, and he swears vengeance. Interestingly, the planet is not destroyed, just all of the humans on the planet have been killed. Right. Or at least the royal family. I'm not sure we ever even established that the entire planet was enslaved or anything like that. Good point. Maybe there'll be more in our future, who knows? Meh. Anyway couple more shots of Jesus. And then we find that Garia chased Professor Monster to Earth. During the Sengoku period. Yeah! Yeah! Professor Monster came to Earth 400 years ago, which we knew, but that is when he built Monster Bem. Yeah. We were given the impression last week that he spent 400 years developing it. This week, it much more sounded like he just showed up and built it. Right. My guess is over 400 years, eh, he had some prototypes. Meh. But uh, also, we get a very convoluted explanation that apparently 
20 Earth years is a planet spider year. So yeah, Garia is only aged 20 years in the 400 years, which which I feel it was unnecessary, but I guess there were too many people asking, well, is he 400 <laughs> years old? He doesn't look 400 years old. So instead of making him 400 years old, he only ages 20 years yeah. or something. Instead of saying, he's an alien, deal with it. He has a long lifespan. Nope. We, we spend probably a good two minutes clarifying uh, the equivalent of dog years for Spider-World. Yep. So, so... Garia chases Professor Monster to Earth, finds him, and they have just an incredible showdown. Eh. They're swinging around on rope trees. Yep. They're chucking bombs at each other. Yep. They're both wearing just incredible headpieces. Yes, yes. And at the end of it, Professor Monster uses, like, essentially an outer space hand grenade to rip open a chasm in the earth under the feet of Garia, who falls into the bowels of earth. Right. Into his eventual spider poison cave. Right. This is where we picked up last week. Turns out he just hung out there for tw- for 400 years slash 20 spider years. Right. And he also sent... Also, he sent uh, Leopardon slash Marveller away. Just go fly into space. I'll call you when I need you to come back. I love that Marveller is voice activated. He didn't even like push a wrist communicator or anything. He just shouted out of the earth. Yep. And Marveller's like, okay, I'm out. Yeah, Marveller just heads to outer space. Uh, and then. And then- we take a photo journey through 400 years of Japanese history and the moon landing. And Jesus. Well, yeah, then we're back to Jesus. <laughs> yep, we do. We get like a cut montage showing us how 400 years passed. Professor Monster was apparently slumbering for those 400 years. I guess. I don't know. That all was very murky. <laughs> and then we do close on like a long shot of Garia fading into the Christ. Yep. Yep. Because Garia saved me by making me Spider-Man. Space Spider Jesus. Yep. Uh, also, by the way, if uh, if you don't revenge yourself on Professor Monster, uh, he he will destroy the Earth. So, yeah. so you should get on that. Okay, that very long digression aside, we are now back. Oh, no, we're not back in the house yet. We are at a scene with Hitomi talking to. Was it Takoya's sister? Is that who it was? I think so. Because they are also coming to the to the church to visit the gravestone of their father. Right. Right. So as they're walking in, Takoya's walking out, and they are talking about a passenger on the train who claims to have seen a ghost. Yes, although, uh, as we'll see later, I question question his description of this as a ghost. But yeah, there's somebody who saw something. Yep. So Takoya says, you have to take me to him. This is important. Right. And Hitomi goes, because, hey, we can we can interview this guy, oh. because apparently, sure, I'm a, I'm a reporter as well as a photojournalist, so. Cub reporter. Yep. Unfortunately, uh, this dude's super dead. Yep, super dead. Dead within the last five minutes. There's police all around. So, without him there to tell the story, Hitomi says, well, here's what I heard. And we get a flashback. To what appears to be a floating brain firing lasers at the train? Yeah, that is not a ghost. Whoever wrote down ghost was not paying attention to this story. Yeah, it's just a brain, complete with, like, uh, brainstem and everything. Yep, and it can fire lasers. What brain can't fire lasers? (laughs) That's just not a brain that I would want. (laughs) So, Takoya... Tells Hitomi immediately, like, look, you can't tell anyone this because clearly that dude was killed because he knew this. If you let anyone know that you know, they'll kill you, too. 
Well, it's a good thing we're all going to get away from this situation (laughs) scot-free. Yeah, because this is where the bad guys show up. Uh, and, And our hero pulls the classic, classic 1970s as perfected in the 1970s Superman of... Uh, the hero boyfriend running away like a coward because he's secretly the hero. Yeah. <laughs> yep. He tells her, you got to run. Let's, uh, let's split up. And he changes into that spider suit very fast. He sure does. It's a good thing, though, because the Ninders have shown up. Ninders, Which... by the way, is apparently what those bird putties are called. I wish they had a better name than that. I wish their name was also bird based because it's clear they have bird beaks on and that that is distracting to me. Yeah. So they show up and just do some crazy back flipping. Yep. And front flipping and just just real weird flipping. Yeah. There's some strange editing choices here. Is it just me, or is all of the editing backwards of the way it should be? It certainly feels like it at times. So Hitomi uh, gets herself surrounded by the Ninders. Right. Which I believe there are enough of them to surround her in whatever shot they need to surround her in. Yes. And she is about to be killed when Spider-Man shows up with his famous spider net. Sweep. Zweep, zweep, spider nets for everybody. Yeah. Uh, which only serves to break the fight from Hitomi because they don't all stay in the spider nets. Do you, Brian, also get the sneaking suspicion that a lot of this show is going to take place at unfinished construction sites? Uh, yeah, I do. Unfinished <laughs> construction sites or quarries. Uh, yeah. Anywhere where there is significant, you know significant vertical surfaces that perhaps Spider-Man can crawl up. Yep. Lots of big machinery and exposed right. girders. Uh, viewers, Spider-Man takes at least a good three minutes just crawling on girders away from any fighting in particular. Yeah. Just crawling up and over and on and uh, just generally ignoring what he's supposed to be fighting because uh, guy's got a Guy's got to climb. A lot of screen time in this fight was dedicated to Spider-Man slowly climbing across girders. Yep. There weren't guys on the girders or anything. No, he climbed down the end of one to get to the ground to get back to fighting. Right. And fight he does. Yeah, with some real sketchy looking slow-mo martial arts. I don't know what you're talking about. Spider-Man is an excellent martial artist. (laughs) <laughs> so he wins more or less the ninders run away and we are we we see the amazonists and professor monster basically lecturing their soldiers for not beating spider-man right they need dead more dead spider-man also a nearby spider on the tree is spying on them Dun, dun, dun. Also, Hitomi took zero pictures during that encounter. Yeah, good point. All right. Now we are actually back to their house where the kid brother is lecturing Takoya for not fighting to protect Hitomi. Right. Because he ran away and left his girlfriend to die. Totally a valid point, by the way. Right. I mean, yes, he's secretly Spider-Man, but, you know, you're you're going to have to deal with this for a while. Yep. And they're all talking about, like, who was that crazy spider thing that saved him? His name is Spider-Man. Yeah, Takoya real seriously drops, that is Spider-Man. Like, he is the authority on this subject. Which, of course, he is, but it makes no sense to anyone else that he would be right nobody really calls him out on it no but then the spider's back to visit gar is here again yep uh so that gar can officially officially shuffle off this yeah 
mortal coil, as it were. When Garia kept popping back up this episode, I thought like, oh, okay, uh, maybe the spider is just going to be our Zordon. Right, and I was praying that that was not the case because <laughs> there are a lot of shots of that spider, and I don't need that in my life. Lucky for you, he basically had just transferred the last of his life energy into becoming a spider for about a week. Right. What what could suggest that perhaps he didn't think his cunning plan the whole way through? Because yeah. I don't know about you, but like it seems like it would take more than more than a week to be okay with. Hey, is this kid really going to be Spider Man? Yeah. And let's face it, this kid hasn't really done anything impressive this episode to this point, other than fight some putties. But apparently, that's good enough because uh, it's time. It's time for Spider Garia to die. Yep, he shows up, the Iron Cross is on the move again, and then he straight up dies in Takoya's bedroom. The awesome announcer pops back in to let us know that Garia can finally rest. Well, good for him. Yeah, because I mean, it's time it's time for Spider Man to go on patrol. Yep. With his spider sense, which gives him the ability to foresee the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Man, you thought now, Spider Sense was powerful last week. Right. Now, I mean, that is technically how Spider Sense works. Yeah. In a very in a very like I know that that fist is going to be where my head is if I don't move sense. And they don't they don't really clarify this at all. So I'm going to believe that um Spider-Man is just opening a Psychic Friends hotline shop. Yeah. Call, call me now. Yep. That's his side job. Anyway, he climbs back up that building, gets yep. back on his corner roof perch, and just, like, reaches out the tendrils of spider sense into the city. Until something happens. Yeah. He finds Iron Cross and then jumps in a car that... He was storing in the church. Sure. Is this the GP7 or was this just another spidery looking car? I think there's only one spidery looking car. I think it is always the GP7. But later which... the GP7 is going to get ejected from Marveler. No, I think what happened was when he gets there later, the GP7 either self drove or he parked in Marveler first. Okay. Okay. So he gets the GP7 from church. Yep. Takes off. And what is going on is the Iron Cross army is attacking another train. This one that is full of airplane fuel. Right. I I guess they're attacking it for kicks? Apparently, yeah. There's no, like, evil plot in place here other than destroy the train. Right. This time, instead of just laser blasting the train itself, the brain... Laser blasts the track a few feet ahead of the train. And yep. Spider-Man swings in to heroically pull the brake lever. Right. Let me tell you, dear listener, trains don't stop like that. No. They take, you know, a couple uh, miles to actually slow down. Not That's... this one. This one stops on a dime. Yeah. I mean... You know, maybe the Japanese are considerably ahead of us in train tech. I was amused to note that in visual media everywhere, Spider-Man saves trains. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, man. Saving trains. It's, uh, it's a big thing. There are a lot of runaway trains that Spider-Man has to stop. Yeah. Including in Spider-Man 2. Yeah, he needs to tell Tobey Maguire that there's just a brake lever, man. <laughs> uh... And this is where we are informed that the floating brain is, in fact, the Machine Bem Sotaken. Yep. It just says it. Yeah, because it needs I... to have a name. Then there is... The most confusingly edited combat sequence I have ever seen. Yeah. The floating brain is there, and then suddenly we're fighting uh We're putties. in a car chase for just a yeah. hot minute. Then okay, we are yes, swinging through trees. Chase. Yep. 
And then we're fighting the bird putties. Yep. The brain, I guess, is just hanging out off to the side somewhere while this goes on. Lots of fighting by a riverbed. Lots of hilarious rope pranks. Yep. All the while, the theme song replays in its entirety. Yep. Well, we have to play it so that eventually we can summon Leopard on. Yeah. And, I mean, nothing beats yeah, 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 wow. <laughs> uh, it's charming, though, isn't it? It really is. I, I, I love it. So he beats all the Ninders. And suddenly the floating brain has a body? Right. And it now no longer resembles a floating brain at all. I came up with Umber Hulk for what it looks like. That's not too far off, actually. Yeah. It's just like it just kept a body nearby, complete with an empty head, apparently. Yep. It drops down into that sucker and then grows. Uh, Spider-Man knows that it is it is time to not try to fight this on foot. Yeah. yeah. He did, before it grew, there was, I wanted to mention this, a scene where he just jumped into the air and caught the brain and threw it into a stone wall. Yep. That's, that what, that's what caused the brain to go seek out a body. It was getting manhandled by Spider-Man. Yep. So Spider-Man, after he grows, Spider-Man summons Marveller. And right. then gets shot out of the sky. Yeah. Well, he summons Marveller because he then needs to summon from Marveller the uh, GP7 so he can get into the GP7 and go back to Marveller. But he gets shot the heck down first. <laughs> yeah. And then he just hops back into the car and flies back. Yeah. 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 It, um, was, it was fairly anticlimactic as far as shooting out of the sky goes. Yeah. It was... It was fun for a second, but then it was like, okay, no, I'm not I'm not getting shot out of the sky. That's silly. <laughs> yeah. Uh he changes into Leopardon. Yep. Uh shoots some spider string, which I presume does nothing. I yep. I don't I don't know if it tripped the guy or what. Uh interesting then, to learn that Leopardon does have spider string somehow. Right? Sure. Hey, he's from Planet Spider. Point. Uh uh Arc turn, which is like a boomerang thing from Leopardon's head, kind of. Yep. Uh, but all of that, all of that is irrelevant because then we just go to sword vigor, uh, which is, of course, sword lights up, throws sword, machine bem explodes. Yeah, just like last week, just javelin tosses that sword right into the chest of the bem, and it explodes. Right. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, that is generally going to be the win all the time move. <laughs> all of the time. Future Sentai shows will will figure out that maybe you shouldn't have one move that always wins. This show is not the show to do that. And we are treated with uh, the same message that I think we get at the end of every week, which is don't lose Spider-Man. Sage advice, man. Yeah, don't lose. And we're out. That's the end of this week's episode. Yeah, this week's episode, I think, because it didn't have to carry the 900 things going on last week, and because it spent a quarter of the episode just explaining some of the flashbacks <laughs> from last week, made it significantly easier to follow. Yeah, the plot evened itself out a little this week. I could have done with a little more Spider-Man time, but we've got 39 more episodes. Yep, yep. I could it's also a... deal with a little bit more from Leopardon, but I'm not sure we're ever going to get that. I actually think, if anything, we eventually get less from Leopardon. Ah, fair I enough. Think Le I think Leopardon just shows up to uh, destroy things. Yeah. <laughs> Remember... The source material used for Spider-Man was not very good to begin with, so. True. Uh, but yeah, that is that is episode two of The Spider-Man Who Loved Me. Yeah, we'll, uh, presumably we will be back to do episode three, but for the meantime, this is going to do it for another episode of Super Sentai Buddies. Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind us that you can find us just all over the place. 
type Super Sentai Brothers into the Google Box machine, and there we are. You can look us up on Retrograde Orbit Radio, on the web, on Twitter. You can email us at Super Sentai Brothers or at Retrograde Orbit Radio at gmail.com. We're just type our name into Google. You'll find us. It's not that hard. And if you're looking for us specifically, we also do the Mount Olympus podcast going through Hercules and Xena. Yeah, it's great. And there are lots more silly hats over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that that show is all about the hat game. Once again, we are the Super Sentai Buddies. I'm Mark. I'm Brian. And we will see you next week for The Greatest Show on Earth. Spider-Man. Spider-Man.